everyone. I am uh, Ben Bredigan here with Onyx Hunt, and we are super excited uh, to have everyone with us today. We've we've got a great great presentation. I'm joined by Mr. Tom Carpenter of Pheasants Forever, and uh, we're really really looking forward to having you here tonight. So we're gonna take a few minutes, let everyone roll in here and and get settled. Uh, then we'll kick things off. Just remember that your uh, audio is off and we can't see you. So don't worry, uh, you're good to go. Um, so again, we have Mr. Tom Carpenter of Pheasants Forever with us. So Carp, what uh, what are you looking forward to this season? Well, well, Ben, I've been uh, shark tail hunting has been the, the name of the game thus far and a little dove hunting, believe it or not, found uh, qu quite a few doves up in North Dakota. You know, there's a lot of wheat this year uh, for various reasons, some related to what's going on in the world. And uh, wheat is not a bad thing for upland game birds. If you can have crops, it's a pretty good one. And it, it seems to have held a lot of doves up there. So had some fun dove hunts up there, mostly uh, sharp tails. And going back this week again, back up to North Dakota for another sharp tail uh, sojourn. So that's been the name of the game. Haven't hit any... Uh, rough grouse yet, sort of waiting for, for woodcock to open. I, uh, I'm sort of funny, I call um, forest hunting, I go woodcock hunting and get bonus rough grouse. Most people, are, most people treat it the other way, but I, I'm a woodcock hunter and oh, one of those big nasty grouse. So waiting, waiting for a few woodcock. Um, and I'll do a little bit of that. I'm gonna go out to Montana and do some hunts first week of October uh, for a story for next year's super issue for Pheasants Forever. And um, then it's all pheasants all the time, all the way through, except for a couple of dalliances, as I call them, with whitetails. <laughs> Sounds like a heck of a year. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, it looks like we've got a bunch of people rolling on here. A um, couple things to note before we kick things off here. Um, if you, uh, you want to use the, the chat, uh, that's, you know, if you're just talking with each other in the chat, if you want to ask questions, be sure to use the Q&A down at the bottom. Um, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the master class, we'll be able to get to some of your questions. Unfortunately, not all of them, but hopefully we cover a lot of them in, in the presentation here. Um, so it looks like uh, we people are rolling in. We're good to go. So we're going to kick things off here. Um, so again, I am joined by Mr. Tom Carpenter here, affectionately known as Carp. So if you hear me call him that, that's, that's his nickname. But he is the editor of the Pheasants Forever Journal. And uh, uh, super excited to have you with us, Carp. And I'd love for you just to take uh, a few minutes and give us a little bit about your background. Well, I'm uh, currently the editor at Pheasants Forever. I've been here five years. And uh, I'm only the third editor in the history of Pheasants Forever. One was the founder, Dennis Anderson, and one was Mark Herwig for a long, long time. So I'm proud to be the third in the in Pheasants Forever's 40-year history. Um, I came up through the outdoor writing ranks. Um, I've been, I published my first outdoor article in 1982 when I was in college for the Monroe Evening Times in Monroe, Wisconsin, where I grew up. Uh, went to high school. For those of you who don't know Wisconsin, it's in the Driftless in the southwest corner of the state. And... Um, we had a lot of good numbers of pheasants down there. Uh, those who've read me, I saw a couple of comments coming through as, um, uh, you know, you sent some of the questions for tonight's, tonight's session. People ask, do I still hunt with basset hounds? Well, I grew up hunting with basset hounds. My family had a, a kennel of bassets and they were field basset hounds and we hunted ra rabbits and pheasants behind them. Um, make great pheasant dogs, believe it or not. And what makes them good is they're slow. And the roosters don't really run. They just sort of circle and they're like, what the heck's going on? The only problem with bassets is they like fur more than feather. And when you run across a rabbit, they're off on a rabbit. Um, and you could always tell by how fast they were going, what they were chasing. So I ended up moving to Minnesota after school at the University of Wisconsin, continued my outdoor writing, went through various other uh, angles to my career, part of which was 14 years at the some people might remember the old North American hunting and fishing clubs. I was the creative director, editor in chief there for many years. And then spent a few years doing digital. And through all that, I maintained my freelance outdoor writing, continually more and more focusing on uplands, uh, including whitetails and turkeys. Um, 
it'll last for outdoor life and field and stream. Uh, but then a few years ago, I got the chance. Um, hopefully I'm on the, I got ways to go in my career here, but uh, hopefully this is my last stop and edit pheasants forever. And it's been a great, it's been a great place. You know, you feel good about what you do and you work at pheasants forever. And maybe toward the end, we can talk a little bit about what pheasants forever does for habitat and birds and all upland wildlife. And uh, that's what really gets me energized in addition to hunting, which is just part of that whole whole picture. But I am a pheasant hunter at heart. I've hunted pheasants for 49 years. Uh, I got my first one on the railroad tracks west of Monroe, Wisconsin in 1974. And for those who would say, oh, you can't hunt on railroad tracks, I say, well, we could in those days. And my dad was the depot agent. Uh, interesting story. I used to ride the train out and they dropped me off eight, 10 miles west of town and I'd hunt back with a basset hound. I'd take a basset out of our kennel. So um, I played hook, my dad understood the value of the outdoors, so I'd hunt back to town. Um, but when I moved up to Minnesota, I also became a grouse hunter and um, in addition to pheasant hunting, and then I discovered really what even better pheasant hunting was um, because Minnesota has a lot more pheasants than Wisconsin even then. and since I wanted in pheasants in 14 states, um, from Utah, Montana, Idaho, to Illinois, uh, Missouri, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska, Minnesota, uh, just that, that core pheasant range. Yeah. Um, I currently, you saw, if people were online, they saw my current dog in my picture up front during the, when the session started, I have a little Epignol Breton, better known as a French Brittany. And um, she's all of 30, she was 32 pounds at the vet. And he's like, you got to cut her down a little bit. And I said, well, it's sharp season, that'll take care of itself. So she's yeah. after one run through North Dakota, she's down to about 30 and a half. She'll be, she'll be 28 and a half or 29 by the time pheasant season is over. And um, that's, that's large, awesome. little doggy. So that's, uh, that's my story. Um, I could, I could talk all night and tell hunting stories. But if you've read some of my stories in Pheasants Forever Journal, you know a lot of them, and uh, maybe we'll get a chance to spin a few tonight as we get into some nuts and bolts of finding pheasants and finding places to hunt pheasants. Awesome. Well, you're an absolute wealth of knowledge, and and we're super thankful to have you and and be partners with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. So thanks for joining us, and and everyone out there, thank you guys for for coming along. I'm really excited. I know I'm going to learn something as well. And, and hopefully you guys can uh, take something away and be more successful this season. So um, just, just go through a few housekeeping items for, uh, there's been a number of people that have joined in. Um, your, your video is off, you're muted. Uh, use the Q and A at the bottom. If you want to ask questions, um, we'll be posting a link in the chat here uh, for some giveaways. So if you want to sign up, try to win some Onyx swag, uh, we'll post the link periodically here in the chat. You can check it out. Um, but without further ado, we're going to get things kicked off here. And we're going to be talking, I mean, the topic of today is how to use Onyx to find pheasants and also how to hunt them more effectively. So we're going to be breaking down everything from, um, you know, picking the right properties through hunting tactics, which carp is the king of pheasant hunting cat tactics. So uh i'm stoked um so we're gonna kind of we'll, we'll start things off here um and i'm gonna pose this question to you carp i am let's just say i am i've never been pheasant hunting before and want to go pheasant hunting for the first time let's just say we'll pick on south dakota just because it is um you know the pheasant capital so i want to go to south dakota for the first time never never done it before where do i even start where, where do I, how do I start finding properties to even go on? What's the first thing you do when you're going to a new state for the first time? Well, I'm going to start, I'm going to start my talk by this. Nobody can tell any of my spots, but this is what my on X looks like. Can you see that? <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, it's just Matt, it's just all, it's all covered from Western Minnesota to South Dakota, Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska, that's all it is. So if you're wondering, do I use Zon X? The answer is yes. So <laughs> what do I look, where, where do you start when you want to go somewhere? Yeah. 
a lot of us on here are hunt close to home. You know, what a blessing if you can you know, leave your house and hunt a couple hours in the afternoon. You need to find spots. A lot of what we're talking about here with this you know, starter question is, where do, if I want to travel to hunt, how do I pick a spot? Most of us are public land hunters. I'd say, I mean, I, I've actually analyzed it. People know I keep hunting journals. I do about 90% of my pheasant hunting is on public land. Um, occasionally I get a chance to hunt somewhere that's not. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm cheating if I get to. Um, so I am a public land hunter. What do I look for? You know, the first thing is to do things. I think we might take a little look at it is you got to sort of start at where, what state do I want to go? You know, if I'm going to travel and, you know, uh, uh, today, just today, uh, Pheasants Forever's annual pheasant hunting forecast came out. It's a great place to start to sort of see where do I want to go this year? I want to travel. I want to get somewhere and find some birds. Um, and, you know, I, 22 states from this forecast, and I'm not, I'm not pushing it. I'm just saying this is one. There's other, you know, you can go to each state too. The good pheasant states, a lot of them, Kansas, the great report, Nebraska, Minnesota, they all have their own granular state level reports. We, we synthesize and summarize. Um, but I'd start at these state level reports and see where, Where's the, where's the hatch been good? Where when the, where of the states that do roadside counts? Where are those good? Um, and if you read some of the reports this year, uh, last year to this year was a big difference. Last year drought was everywhere. This year, drought was less commonplace. And the farther north you went, the more moisture we had. And the farther east you went, the better the moisture was. And the farther west you get, a little tougher it was. So. This year, you know, according to what I can tell from the intel from our trusted, uh, and, and I did the Minnesota report, I had other writers, Anthony Hauk in North Dakota, Andrew Johnson in South Dakota, um, different writers uh, do different states. And this year, I think North Dakota is going to be a lot better than it was last year. There's just no doubt about that. And part of that is the habitat isn't going to be as uh, grazed or hay from the emergency haying, which is very important for our agricultural producer partners. Um, that's just the way it is on CRP type lands. Um, Iowa, very good. Uh, uh, Western Minnesota, I think Minnesota is gonna be good this year. Um, I think once you get in down into Kansas and Nebraska, it's a little tougher, can be a little tougher with the drought conditions that are down there. Um, I think areas of Montana are gonna be okay. But I think it's spotty there, where, they, where you got some thunderstorms and where you didn't. Montana, we divide that state up. We divide that state up into three parts. Montana's are three states. Um, so I think the core of the pheasant range is going to be a little better everywhere than last year. Some places a lot. Um, so that's sort of the first is your your macro check. What state do I want to go in? And then you got to start in on where am I going to go in that state? And um, you know, a lot of that for public land hunters comes down to where is the public land? Well, no big surprise. That's what, that's what Onyx does for you. Um, I'll never forget, it was two, two years ago, I was telling Ben before this, uh, our program began, my boys and I were staying in the Coteau in, in South Dakota. If you know what that is, it's the high, high country uh, where the potholes are. And it was cold and it was snow. And we had to drive 50 miles each day to not fight that. And one day we came down and, and there was two guys and they were the age of the age of Ben or younger. And they were sitting there with an upside side down map at an intersection trying to figure out where the heck they're going. And I'm sitting there, you know, on my phone going, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. You know, so on X reveals, you know, whether it's walk-in areas, game production areas, waterfowl production areas, wildlife management areas, uh, any way, shape, or form of public land you can find. What do I look for? You know, once you've triangulated, man, I think, and I think we're going to look at in the South Dakota here, just for some examples. Once I triangulated on, I think this area, then it's time to look at where is there a concentration of public lands? You aren't going to hunt if there's not public lands. And I like to look for a lot of public lands because that means a couple things. Um, one, it means 
more room for you, me, everybody to hunt. And two, it often means extended, attached habitat, um, especially if there's game production areas, wildlife management areas. But also, I think we'll look at, at some of this in South Dakota. Just as an example here, their CREP, which is a Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, open to public hunting, essentially CFP, but it's called CREP in this part of, of South Dakota. Um, and that's just one example. Why do, why do I like a lot of public lands all in one area, preferably contiguous? Because there's a lot of hunters there, and there are. We have a lot of brothers and sisters and little guys and everybody in the field. If there's a lot of contiguous land, the pheasants don't necessarily leave where we can hunt. They're still on places we can hunt. Um, and I don't know, does that, does that sort of get us going, Ben? Yeah, and, and I'll add another one uh, to the point. That's, that's a really great point about you know, those contiguous pieces of land. Um, I think you, I don't know if you mentioned it before, but simply like if you go to an area, for example, I, I don't know, we're just gonna pick on an area somewhere you know, all of a sudden, like, all right, we're going to go to this area right here. Well, if you look around here, I mean, there is, there's maybe a few pieces of public land and you get to this area, you put all your eggs in this basket into these three spots. And all of a sudden you pull up there, there's a truck on one of them. There's another truck on the other one. There's a third pulling out on the third spot. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I've got to find something else. So then you have to start driving and you you just end up, you know, wasting precious daylight, especially this time of year when, when daylight is at a premium, uh, driving around and figuring it out where, you know, like you were saying, car, you go into some of these areas. Well, so what? There's somebody parked at this piece of public land. I'm just going to drive across the street and hunt this one. So think about some of these big, big ones. Like I consider big piece. 640 acres plus and you can I can go to that one right there just above I mean what's it thousand yeah 1100 acres. acres I hope we're not if we're hot spot in your spot sorry but man you know what it would take my dog if I if I saw that spot in, and I would hunt that spot just by what I'm looking at right here we can get in and, and, but I'd take my dog I'd take my water I'd take a sandwich I'd probably be out there for five six hours it take all day for me to hunt that alone with my dog. I mean, mm -hmm. this, and it's big enough that if somebody else hunted it, those birds are probably still out there. And if you get far away from where the access is, or in a spot that's hard to get to, or people love my word hell holes, find some hell holes, you're gonna find birds on a place like that. Look at that one up to the north and east of that. Looks like a wildlife area. I think I there's, it looks like there's, that's a lot of that is, is actual lake, I think. Oh, okay. But, but you see what I do? I'm like, wow, look at that big one. Let's look yeah. at that. Now, that doesn't mean these satellites can't be good. I call those pickpocket properties. Those can be good, but if they got hunted two days ago, there might not be a bird on them. Or it, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. pocket po properties can be great. I can tell you stories all day about those, but look for them in, within the, within the, I call it a complex of these public lands. Because a lot of the times they get forgot about, like it, it over they're overshadowed by those larger piece of public land versus, you know, just an island out by itself, it might get hit, but a yep. lot of times they're overshadowed. Um, what's, what's your take, Carp, on pressure and like proximity to larger cities? Do you, does that have any bearing on where you're choosing to hunt? Um, no. <laughs> no. Interesting. Some of my some of my best spots in North Dakota, I could drive if I lived in Bismarck, they'd be my evening spot. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really bother me. Um, you know, and there's not that many places in pheasant country that are that I would consider real population centers. I mean, no plus by geography. Yeah, no no secret in Minnesota, people know about Marshall. No secret, Marshall's got a lot of hunters. No secret, there's a lot of birds down there. No secret, you better be ready to work to find them because they have PhDs, but they're there, I guarantee it. Um, so I, don't, I don't worry too much about that. You know, I go to some some traveling down sometimes toward the western corridor of Iowa and eastern Nebraska. You're not that far from Omaha, you know. Um, so I don't worry about that too much. I do feel better the farther away you get, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry a whole heck of a lot. 
about that. Sure. Awesome. Um, all right. So, so let's just say, you know, I, no, I can't say I've even hunted in this area, so we're not hot spotting. Like it's just an area we're going to use for an example here. Um, you know, we're looking at here and there's some, so there's some big concentrations of public land. Another thing I personally look for is a mix of land ownership types. Um, you can see I've got the layers on here uh, for South Dakota. This is going to be a big one. These are the layers that uh, I used. Carp, I'm sure it's probably similar. Uh, I'll always have private land, government land, and then, for example, this is walk-in. So South Dakota walk-in, Kansas, it's Weeha, Montana block management. And a lot of these pheasant states have these great, awesome, fantastic programs to utilize. So um, generally North those- Dakota Platts. Yep, exactly. Um, so they'll be all in your layer library under each state. Um, so these are the ones that that I suggest turning on when you're out searching for these properties. So um, let's we just honed in on this area. Um, lots of you know, there's there's a giant concentration of public land. Um, where do we go next, Carp? How do we start? You know, we we talked a little bit about you know how you like these these larger properties. Um, what what in particular? Let's like kind of drill down into these properties. And I would love for you to explain what you're seeing in them that is desirable for you outside of just being those large contiguous plots. All right. So I, if I, I'm trying to scroll here and on, on myself here, the first thing I'd look for, it, you know, first of all, you picked one that I would pick. I always like to start on state or federal lands. Walk-ins are great, but you have a better chance, like this is WPA, or a game production area, but that habitat is managed by Game and Fish, Game and Fish and Parks, DNR, and that there's habitat management going on in the form of burns, brush cuts, you know, whatever it is, and it's it's managed for wildlife actively. Walk-ins aren't always; they're often, you know, CRP or crap, and where, where that where's that land and its management contract? So. I love that you picked this one out. That's where I would go. It's one, it's 1,000 acres, it's big. This is a spot I would hunt. First, I would look at the access. You know, you got, you, you got your county road over here on the east side, lots of access. If you can shrink it down, I don't think yeah. there's, um, I don't think there's a lot of other access to it, which I also, no. because how many people are really, look, ben, Ben's already marketing. Um, how many people like sh show me the full thing again? How many people are going to walk? It's probably a mile to that back side. Not very yeah. many. Um, no, I mean, so I'm just I like looking. I like the limited access. I like the other land around it. Um, I think it abuts up to something on the west there that's public. Well, that's South Dakota Trust. That's not public in South Dakota. Um, like North Dakota, you can hunt trust land. In South Dakota, you can't. But that's probably that's probably a um, rangeland, which could be good for pheasants. It's got probably got grass on it, I would guess, if, yeah. if, from the looks of it there. Um, so what would I do on this big WPA? You know, I'd look at what 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 do I like about it? Um, I look around and make sure there's some cropland around. I'm sure there is. It's South Dakota. When I got on the ground. I would, you know, try and look for where the cropland is. The pheasants might be a long way from it. They might fly in and out to feed, or they might be right next to it. But you're going to want some cropland. Um, that doesn't so it look like in in 2000. It'd be in 2021. The south side of this is, was bordered by soybeans. Um, I yep. try use the, you know, if you guys haven't seen this um, or use it, this is an incredible resource I use all the time for for scouting online. It's uh, the, the U.S. crop distribution layer here, um, and it, I think we have 19 different crops in there, a lot of the, the most common ones. So um, like this is showing on the south side of this property, there's soybeans. Um, it's 2021 data, and with you know the, the price of corn and whatnot right now, you can almost guarantee this is probably going to be corn this coming year. Would you agree, Carp? Yeah, and I would also say what, what really matters is you know that's a crop field, you know, that it's going to be in something, corn, 
probably corn or soybeans. Ben and I were talking to people were on before the show started. I was up been up in North Dakota tail and dove hunting and and there's a lot of weeds up in North Dakota for various reasons. And um, I don't know if there's as much in South Dakota. Bottom line is pheasants need any crop is good, whether it's milo, wheat, corn, soybeans. Um, that's what you want to know. So what do we've got here? We've got a thousand acres of grass that's guaranteed cattails. You can see them along these along these sloughs. Go, go um, ahead and explain to people like how do you know these are cattails, Carp? Well, it's South Dakota and it's water. And you can also see that ring around it. The lighter, the lighter stuff you can tell is grass. Like where where the circle where Ben's doing that circle right now is um is you can tell that's water. And then you can see that light around it, depending on where when they took this picture. A lot of that might be algae, it might have been a summertime picture, but you can tell that that that, that dark color is usually cattails. Um believe it or not. I can also tell willows sometimes, um, but we. But I, I can just tell these are cattails. And that little that little lobe up there, depending on the year, could be all cattails. If that if it's a dry year, you know, depending on compared to when this aerial photography was taken, you know, you want to you want to look for a winter a winter hellhole where might there might be a lot of pheasants. It's right right where that circle was right now. That little right there. But what yeah. I like here is all the contours. Um, this is a hilly area. This is in the Coteau of South Dakota. You'll find this type of country in North Dakota, certain areas in Nebraska, Kansas, and the Smoky Hills and stuff like that. And what what that what those contours mean is there's lighter grass up high, there's heavier grass at uh, mid grass on the sides, there's heavier, taller grass down below, and then you got cattails next to those sloughs. And it gives the birds a lot of options for where they want to be throughout the day and where they want to hide out. Some days they want to be up in the sun and see 100 miles. Some days they want to be nestled in a cat where, where it would take a, an act of God to kick them out. And you've got all that within, I, I, would, I would tell you on one of these peninsulas, like hold it right here, that peninsula just to the west of your blue, your blue uh, as you go west from your blue circle, a pheasant has everything he needs right there. He's got high, short grass up high, tall grass down low, cattails, and then probably with the flight, he's got a crop field down to the south. Yep. And when they walk to you, they'll fly too, believe me. Um, um, it, it's where they need to go. One thing like you were touching on before with like, you know, this is one of the biggest aspects I think um, that makes people good at uh, scouting online is being able to see what, being able to see, uh, look at an aerial imagery and then be able in their mind to picture what that looks like on the ground because then uh, you can go and replicate these spots like this. So um, like you were saying, generally the lighter the color, the thinner it's gonna be, the darker the color, like you can see in this little pocket here, the color gets a little darker, that's gonna be thicker grass. And then around these edges, um, there's going to be cattails and then obviously water is going to be dang near black here. Um, another thing that I look for as well is, is, is you're looking, I call it a mosaic of cover. Um, just like Harp was saying, you've got light, you've got dark, you've got everything that pheasant needs within, you know, X amount of area. So. And some, some people would look at this and go, man, there's not a tree on the place. I don't know. And I'd say, man, there's not a tree on the place. This is a beautiful place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. pheasants, pheasants don't need any trees. We can talk about shelter belts, but um, in, in their relation to winter cover sometimes, it, they, that does have a play. Um, yeah. But the, the property's got everything going for it. Um, so, contours. So, you know what? So, it's oh, got okay. contours, it's got grass. It's got cattails um, and it's got crops in it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so if we were going to break this down a little bit further, um, you're 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 going to go hunt this. Is there any like rhyme or reason to how you would break down this property in terms of where you would walk? Because, um, like you said, like there are a number there are a number of key objectives in here and this would literally probably take you multiple days to walk the whole thing. 
do you have a strategy of kind of how you would cover this? Depends how the wind is, and we'll, we'll talk some more about wind when we do strategies. Um, the thing about wind is it it doesn't always cooperate. It blows from one direction, and usually, for the, unless you're extremely lucky, rarely does the wind blow good for you on the way out and, and switch around and blow in your face on the way back. You've got to you've got to make your bets on the wind and work with it. Um, and we can talk a lot more about that later, but I would, I, my, my approach would be based on the wind and where, where winds come from all directions. Let's, let's say you, you pick, you pick a direction and I'll tell you what I would probably do. So I just pulled up this wind calendar and it looks like for tomorrow, it's going to be, or tomorrow it's going to be a Northwest wind at 20 miles an hour. I would start. If I had a whole day on it, we'll start with that. If I had a whole day and nobody was out there, I would start somewhere down at the way at the lower, the southeast edge, um, around where you have the access sign. And to be honest with you, I might even take a little swing through that pickpocket property just south of there, or I'd leave it that little triangle. But if I was going to hunt this property and I was starting it at 10 o'clock, I would make my run into the wind. Why? Because that's when my dog is freshest. That's when I'm freshest. And you'd walk all day here to get the wind in your favor. And then we're all petered out. So I would start and I would probably, I would just start in and I mean, I got to be honest with you with my dog. I just start following her and we would hunt in the Northwesterly fashion. We'd go up. We'd, follow, we'd go up and down some of those contours. We'd probably cut south of where, where your circle is right now, that, that piece of water just east of it. We'd either cut south of that and go through that little point if it was frozen. We might go around the, the east side, not that one, the other more towards the road, that, that piece of water toward the road. I'd probably not go close to the road though, because that's probably other hunters that are coming in that way. I'd probably head through, go through that little isthmus between the two there, yep, and get up, yep, right in there. And I would just go back and forth and around. I'd go up on that plane. I'd hit those little potholes. You can see those little potholes up on the plane. I'd circle around those. And I'd just mosey, wander, look, follow my dog. In general, keep that pin in my face for two, three, four hours and, and see what happens. I mean, I would just keep going. Then I'd pick something. By the time I'm back to that, where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service hunting WP open content content is on that that uh, that big piece of water, I'd probably head around the north side of that, and because that you're still heading in the wind, I might cut across between those two. I still, as long as I've got the wind crossing, I don't care. In fact, it's just heading into the wind is one thing, but crossing the wind coming at you, but letting your dog go back and forth and court across and walking across the wind back and forth with the wind coming at us is probably what I would do. And I'd spend all day out there. I'd have food, I'd have water. I'd have water for my dog, a little peanut butter snack for her. And we hunt. I'd hunt all the way to that Northwest corner. And if I didn't have three birds, then I can tell you what I would do. Um, um, but that, that's, that's how I would hunt this uh, with a Northwest wind. North wind, probably, probably wouldn't do that different. A South wind, I'd probably start up at that other end and, and probably cross that top side and then pick, pick my best route through the middle and hunt my way through the middle coming into the south wind. Yeah. No matter what I do, I'd make my last swing my least desirable wind swing. Now, with that northwest wind, I might even hunt all the way to that far west corner. I, I said the northwest up there. If I went to that, you know what I'd do if I still had the rest of the day left and it was the afternoon, then I'd head to that south end, north wind or not, and I'd hunt along those crop edges for the end of the day because those birds might be moving out or they might have been out there feeding. 
in the afternoon, and then they're going to be heading back into some cover or along that south side. But you got a lot of water on that south side abutting those crops. That, that last leg along the south side might be really good because I think that's where those crops were. I'd try and end. I'd try and end the day down there if I was out there the whole day. Um, and if I just had the afternoon, I'd probably do that swing I said and swing back along those crop edges so that I'm hunting my way back toward the vehicle along crop edges at, at dusk at, during the golden hour. Yeah, I mean, like I say, if I have crops abutting a property, um, I'm almost always going to make a swing right next to right next to it, especially uh, first light. You know, if you can hunt right away in the morning, as well as uh, last light, just because it, it, they're just proven producers. I mean, the, the birds have to eat, and by being right next to those crop fields, it just makes it easy access for those birds to go in and out. So I'm just trying to find another property really quick that would be a good example um, of that, that those crops really butting up right next to the, right next to the piece of cover here. So, um, for me, to be honest, like, I, and I don't know, it probably differs for you, Cart, but I'm really spending the majority of my time focused on hunting. If it's not adjacent to crop, personally, I am, uh, I'm going to, stick to more of that stuff that's adjacent right to crops um, just to maximize my day. Um, obviously like in the, in the middle of the days and stuff, I'll, I'll wander a little bit, but that's just kind of my take. I'm, I'm sticking very, very close to, to harvested crops. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that, but I also, I, I do think that hard hunted pheasants on public land, no matter what the state, they can be a long, long, long way from crops and mm -hmm. more interested in saving their feathers than they are eating. They will fly out and fly back. And that's another reason to be near, like you said, near those crops toward the end of the day is you might see birds flying from crops, in, especially in winter, flying back into cover. And no, no big surprise if I have, there you got a spot, if I have, um, if I, if I see a bird land toward the end of the day and it's a half mile over there and I know where it is and I get the wind right, man, I'm, I'm going for it, you know? And um, so you, you're, not only, you're, not, you're not only hunting the birds that might be walking in from the crops, but you're hunting birds that are, that are flying in. But in the middle of the day, man, it doesn't matter if you're a mile from crops, who cares? Mm -hmm. care. Yeah, exactly. So like this, this property I pulled up here, um, this would be a, I mean, a great instance of a property that I would personally hunt. Um, you've got crops, you've got corn, soybeans, pretty much surrounding this property. Um, like Carp was saying, you have a piece of crap here if you, you look in. Um, and what I like to say is good cover almost looks fuzzy. Um, you can, if you look at the texture of the grass, um, when I see this look to it, um, I almost know that's going to be nice, thick, native prairie, CRP, whatever it is. Um, and that's going to be an area I'm going to hone in on. So kind of like what we did with the other spot, uh, and, and Carp, I'd love to hear your convention as well for this, but um, what I do is if I find a good spot, I am going to label it with a waypoint, uh, and I am going to go and make sure that I label it like, okay, this is a pheasant spot. I'm going to put an icon on it, because what happens is when, I mean, when Carp, when you showed us your map, imagine if you only used red X's what your map would look like it would i mean you don't know what areas you might have hunted what areas you did hunt so i, I always tell people it is extremely important to um, utilize your waypoints i don't know if you can see i use red as spots that i don't know that I man this looks good with a pheasant icon yellow is i've hunted it and seen birds or know there are birds there and i guess you call it teal is birds shot you know i, I bird i shoot i mark too and um, I also do some blues. I don't know, I can't recall exactly what I do. That's another sort of a dreamer spot, you know, but I do, that, that's great, great practice is to color code those spots. And I mean, I can, I can use my Onyx to dream about birds I shot because I know that color. I can go into the yellows and say, man, that's a spot 
why did I like this? And I go back and go, oh, this is why I liked it. And then if I've hunted it and seen birds, it'll stay yellow. If I got birds, it'll go to go to green. Um, that's another thing. As a pheasant hunter, you always want to be looking for new spots, not only if you're going somewhere, but if you're going back to your, your, your milk run of places, you never know what's going to happen in that habitat. You always got to be looking at new, new places. Not only does habitat age or in some cases with CRP get taken out, but management happens and this year might not be good for it. Two years, it might be great. Uh, you know, a lot of like Western Minnesota waterfowl is, I remember two, two, three years ago, we came to one, the best, one of our best ones, and it was grazed to the nubs. And we're so sad. And the next year, I shot eight roosters there. And the year after that, I shot 11. And last year, I didn't shoot quite as many. Why? Because it's aging again. And I'm like, get on those cows. So keep looking up, keep looking up new spots. Have a lot in your in your arsenal, in your Onyx arsenal. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and that kind of caveats into to, to another point I wanted to talk about was, you know, if you're going to a new spot, like don't, I mean, what I would do is I would have not only like one or two spots, but when I go to an area, I have 20 spots or 30 spots even because kind of like we talked about before, the last thing that I want is to get to an area and drive by a spot. That one doesn't look good. There's a hunter in this spot. Um, that one doesn't look good. And all of a sudden you've ran through five spots. And again, you're like, okay, now where do I go? And this is kind of where, uh, you know, I, it's not panic necessarily, but you may start to make bad decisions. Like, uh, okay, there, there's a spot right here. Let's, let's go drive to that one and hunt that one. And then you look back on those decisions and you're like, man, that, you know, in hindsight, that didn't look really good. Like that wasn't a great area. So I like to have a bunch of spots. And before the day, I kind of list out my milk run of this is what I want to do. So just that, that pre-planning can save you a lot of time and, and help you be more successful in the field. It looks like, uh, looks like gold carp has froze up. Um, so I guess I'll just continue. Well, carp, you back? Oh, you're on mute again. Uh, if you unmute yourself, you should be good to go. Sorry, my connection went bad, I'm back. No worries, no worries. So. Um, yeah, like I was, I was just saying, just having a repertoire of spots in your area uh, is important. Just, just planning, planning for for your hunt. Um, so, uh, as you know, any other final touch points? We're going to kind of move from, you know, we we found the birds, uh, we've we've marked them with the waypoints. Now I want to go into a little bit about some some tactics, which also play as well into the mapping here. Um, any any final touch points on on finding areas to hunt? No, I, I think we covered it pretty good. I mean, you know, we talked about complexes, concentrations of public land that isn't always available. But you sort of nailed it, Brett. Uh, you, you sort of nailed it, Dan. That you need to have backups. You know that you can't pick out one spot and drive to North Dakota and say this is where we're going to hunt because. You never know what's going to happen. And you, you should, in, in many areas of pheasant country, be prepared to do some driving, too. You, you don't, in Montana, you better be prepared to drive 30, 40, 50 miles. You know, South Dakota, you've got some concentrations. Other places, you're going to have to drive. North Dakota, you're going to have to drive. Uh, so have a number of places lined up. I think that's one of the, one of the best pieces of advice, advice you can have. And if they can be in these complexes, all the better. Awesome. Yeah, 100%. That's that's accurate. And uh, yeah, you can't be afraid to drive. And another if another suggestion is if you can get to the spot, you know, even the night before you're going to hunt, obviously, we're, we've all got jobs. Uh, we've got commitments. Life is busy. But it's I love it when I can get there, whether it's for the golden hour and I can just drive around for 15, 20 minutes, an hour, um, and put eyes on those properties before I can hunt it, or before I want to hunt it in the next day. Um, again, just so you're, so you're maximizing your time in the field. Um, yeah, so let's, let's, let's move on to some, some tactics. So, 
um, if somebody is, if somebody's new to pheasant hunting carp, like what are, I'm sure you've actually probably written an article, like what are some of the golden rules of pheasant hunting? Well, there's uh, we could, we could talk all night on this, I guess. You know, we've, we've hit one of them. The start is hunt where there are pheasants. You know, you've got to do some research. You got to do not only macro research, but also micro research on, on X and figure your spots out. You know, don't be afraid to call the local game wardens, call local pheasants forever employees, uh, call the chamber of commerce, you know, any person to person contact you can have to try and figure out, are there birds in the area? Where might I go? You know, you're not, you never ask anybody for the spot, but you ask them for some advice and you'll be surprised at how willing people are to offer that. Um, other experienced hunters included. Um, so if you're starting out, you got to get yourself to places where there are pheasants. And, and then when you, once you figure that out, it's public land. But, but how do we hunt pheasants? I guess, you know, there's so many things we can talk about. But the first thing is treat them with respect. Pheasants have game caliber senses of hearing and, and especially hearing. And they know what's going on. And many of us, veterans included, have sort of a mindset of, of in, some, in, some, in some days, pheasant hunting is a social occasion, but not for me. It's serious. You are quiet. You are stealthy. You don't pull up to a parking lot. Hey, I, we're going to, you go there. I'll go here whistling and yelling at the dog and let the dog run around. I'll tell you one little tip I do, and it's a big one, is you know your spot and hopefully nobody's there. Um, but I don't get ready where I'm gonna hunt. If I were to pull up at that spot where we're gonna go, I, I, I stop in town, I stop at a ball field, I stop at the back, the back lot of the Casey's, I stop at a cemetery down the road, I let the dogs run and get their yayas out, I get my stuff on. When I slip up, I slip out, pull my gun out of the case and go. There's no rigmarole out there. Now, that doesn't mean you, you got to sneak around and hunt like you're hunting big game. You do have to hunt stealthily, and we can talk about that. But that's one of the biggest things for starters is treat pheasants with the respect they deserve, or they're going to be gone before you even get close to it. Will you see them? You might see them flying. More likely, they're just going to run and run circles around you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think your pro is up again, but yeah, um, he brings up a very good point. A, a lot of the times, like even I'll park a uh, hundred yards away from a spot I'm going to walk yep. into and park there and then just walk that hundred yards because no matter how hard you try to be stealthy, a lot of the times it's just, you know, it's those little, little things like you might slip up, you might, you know, whack the door with your vest or something like that. So um, that's, that's a very, very, very good point. Um, that, that brings that brings up another tip. You, you said park 100 yards away. That's a good tip, you know, akin to getting ready somewhere else. Related to 100 yards away is when you get when you're hunting, you're hunting. There you're going ready. Whether you whether your dog is working or not, or you think it's on a bird or not, you never know when a bird is going to go. If your gun's over your shoulder and you're daydreaming that pheasant has a head start and you're done for. So, I mean, they're simple. Yeah. Always be ready every second you walk. My, my hunting buddy once, one of my hunting buddies once told me, he said, I watched, we could see each other on different ridges. And he said, I watched you that whole way and you never took your gun off being in poor arms ready to shoot. And it's just, it's just what I've always done. But it's what a simple thing you can do to be ready when a pheasant goes. Yeah, and, and to couple that is, you know, I am, I might not always be my gun up, but what I'm always doing is I am, even if I'm, you know, chatting with a buddy that we're walking together, I'm, my eyes are laser focused on that dog. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to hunt a ton behind my dog. So I know, know them inside and out, but uh, knowing those tells from your dog, because then I can, I can a lot of the times, you know, afford the luxury of, of taking my mind off it a little bit, but I'm always watching that dog 
because a lot of times they're going to indicate not always right like there's times for those birds are they're just going to do pheasant things so yeah and that's that's and that's what you got to be ready for the pheasants do pheasant things um you know some other tips you know we can talk a lot about wind dog work um types of cover to hunt at different types of day i mean there's there's any any cornucopia of topics that that, that we could move on to but let's let's get into that i think that's super interesting and interesting is you know yeah how are you breaking down what covers you're hunting uh what time of the day where do you start where do you finish so what's what's your approach what does that look like on that i guess my approach doesn't doesn't vary too much in that you know you said it before you use the perfect word mosaic of cover high grass mid grass low grass cattails shrub lines willows tree line whatever it is cover is a mosaic pasture land to have some mix of cover hopefully and then some crops in the vicinity and i i keep it fairly simple from there and that is you just got to start figuring out where the birds might be and that takes some miles now it's at 10 o'clock we'll, we'll take south dakota as an example or even minnesota by 9 a.m those birds are done feeding they're back in in what I would call midday loping cover. Depending on the type of year, time of year, it might be it might be a ridge of light grass in October. In December, it's going to be cattails, and they're going to be buried in them. So you have to sort of the day too. A nice day in the a nice November day. You might that that maybe a couple of weeks ago it was snowy and crappy, and you found them in cattails. You get a nice sunny day. They're, they might be on a hillside in light grass. You, and you've got you've to think about these things and the conditions and, and, and not be afraid to walk. Uh, that's one thing I love about pheasant hunting. Just get out there and start walking and try different places. Tall grass, low grass, high, high country, low country, cattails, willows. Uh, it, it, any of the birds at any time of day and you just got to start walking and but pay a little attention to what you're doing if you see a bird like stop and think why is there a bird here what is it about this place and i always think about that why is that bird here it's there for a reason whether it's biological in the what what's going on with its day or whether it's it was pushed here by hunters uh no matter think about why those birds are there learn from every one you see especially every one you shoot or miss but also everywhere you see, they're there for a reason. Uh, so think about it. That's that's sort of my best my best tip. I probably worry a little more about wind and and things like that, or at least strategizing on wind when I hunt. I figure I can put on enough miles to find the birds, uh, and and they're just they're just uh, they're just on uh, they don't they don't co they're just uncooperative enough. That they might not be where you think they're supposed to be. Yeah, um, you kind of touched on it earlier. Uh, let's compare and contrast kind of the cover you're looking for. Say from you know we've got opening weekend coming up here for a, a number of different states. Um, let's compare and contrast that early season cover through the middle of the season uh, to late season and and what you're looking for and how your hunting tactics change. Yeah, early season, um, you know. If, if, if our list, any listeners subscribe to Pheasants Forever, to our members of Pheasants Forever, and I hope you are, we'll talk about more of that later. But I wrote my back page column for the fall issue, which we're going to release to the printer tomorrow, about early season hunting and about how some people say, you know, crops are up and there's a lot of hunters out. I'm just going to sit around for a while and I'm like, say what? Every day, every day of pheasant season, on public lands, the roosters' numbers are whittled down one by 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 one. And the ones that don't get shot are getting their bachelor's degree and their master's and then their PhD. And I don't care if there are crops in the fields, there are always birds in grass and you can hunt them and find them. And if you see a standing cornfield and think, yeah, I'm not going to hunt there, it's like, well, give me that field. There will be a bird there somewhere. Uh, there's a PF legend, his name is Scott Raw. I once lamented that to him, Scott Raw. He's from Worthington, Minnesota. And he said, and I wrote this in my story, he said, 
Tommy, there's always birds in the grass. So grass is where it's at early on. And often the lighter, the better. My favorite opening day spot in Western Minnesota is a high ridge and it is, the grass is about this tall up there. And I always shoot a bird mid morning on that ridge, uh, except this year it's grazed, we've done some scouting. But foot tall grass, they're in foot tall grass eating rose hips at 11 o'clock in the morning if I don't get a bird in taller grass. So that's a little extreme, but lighter grass, once they start getting pushed around, heavier grass. You know, early season is grass, and if you know what blue stem looks like, and good native grass and forbs, forbs are wildflowers, that's pollinator habitat. Those are those plants that have the broader leaves. Grass has the narrow leaves. Um, forbs and, and upland native prairie grass is the name of that early season game. Even when the birds are pushed around, they want to be in grass. They will end up in cattails, no doubt. But as, as mid-season comes on, it gets a little colder across the pheasant range. I don't care if you're in North Dakota, Montana, Minnesota. It starts getting colder and the birds start migrating, not migrating, it's not the right word. They start shifting more toward heavier cover because it's colder at night and they need more thermal cover during the day. Then I'm starting to work more towards cattails, the edges of cattails and even into the cattails and then willows and and, and if you're in the, more in the Southern Plains, Kansas, Nebraska, you're thinking more about plum thickets and wind rows and other, other t t fence rows and other thick cover, you know? And then once you're in the late season, it's all about the hell holes, the thick place, the cattails, the willows, the places that the wind can't get to, the places that are miserable for you to walk in, and those are beautiful, baby. Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. Late season is a love, a love hate thing for me. <laughs> it can it's, be great, but it's a slog. <laughs> it's, it's a slog, but man, there's a, a late one. I'm always, any day I hunt pheasants, if, if I can manage to get one pheasant, it's a, it's a day to remember. And even if I don't, it's a day to remember. But in late season, especially give me, give me one rooster that made one little mistake and I was there for it. And they do have to make a mistake for you to get them in that in that late season. But you know that's sort of the it, it's the track I take, and similar to how I describe the day of hunting, you just got to get out. You start to got walk. You got to start walking. You got to just check out different types of cover. You know, I guess the mistake the mistake a pheasant hunter can make is today they're going to be in the blue stem, and that's all I'm going to hunt. If you don't find one in the blue stem, get the hell out of there and hunt somewhere else on higher grass, on cattails. If you say, today they're in the cattails and you don't see any in two hours, maybe you better try some blue stem or some willows or uh, some pollinator type habitat. So you gotta maintain that flexibility. We, we, we don't know what's on a pheasant's mind and we also don't know what the hunting pressure has done to their daily habits. Uh, as, as the season goes on in general, you're going from lighter grass to thicker grass to hell holes of cattails and willows and other bad, bad, bad ass places. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a really good point. And I, I use that strategy of, you know, uh, you were talking about in terms of you're not finding them in blue stem or you're not finding them in cattails. Go try something else. Um, kind of as a broader point, if I go and hunt like five or six spots in a, even in an area and I'm not finding birds, I'm gonna get the hell out of there. I'm gonna yes. go try something else. I'm gonna go yep. move. 40, 50 miles and try a new area. Cause the last thing you want to do is spend, you know, five days of your trip hunting in the same area. I mean, it's a definition yep. of insanity, right? Just take yep. a little move instead of going North from the hotel, go South 50 miles and it could be a whole different ball game. And that's, that has salvaged a lot of trips for me in the past. Absolutely. Burn, burn the gas. Use It's hard during, you know, you think about a November day, December day, North Dakota, South Dakota, we'll say South Dakota, you can't start at 10, you're done at, you're done at sunset. Think about Iowa, you start a little earlier, you're done at 4.30, you know, it's hard to burn up that daylight time, um, but maybe you wanna keep hunting and try it, but the next day, try somewhere else, you know. Exactly. Day, you know, get in, we did a sharp tail hunting in North Dakota, we, we had a hard morning, 
and it doesn't matter, sharp tails, pheasants, grouse, whatever. We had a hard morning, dogs needed a rest. We turned on the AC in our truck, got some cheery colts and some snooze in the cheek and drove not, drove 70 miles and found birds, you know. And um, pheasant hunting, we probably would have stuck it out for the day, but the next day we would have done the same thing. We would have got up and moved, you know. Uh, and you think, what, what could cause that? This habitat's beautiful. I've been summer hailstorm. It's been the hell's been hunted hot of it. Who knows, you know? Yep, that's a fantastic point. Love it. Um, it's funny how, you know, we, we've never hunted together, Carp. And like, I think you are giving the same exact feel that I would. So like, yeah, it's, it's funny. It's funny. It's, it's, it's reassuring. It's interesting. So um, another thing here, before we get to, we're going to get to some Q and a here, but I want to talk, there's, there were a number of questions here about um, gear and I would love to hear your perspective in terms of um, what are you shooting for a gun uh, chokes shot size? What does that look like? Carry as little gear as possible. The only weights I want to carry, if as and if needed, is water for my dog. A place like that place, we depending on what what's going on with the the if it's ice or not. I still want fresh water for my dog. I don't want to rely on what's out there for a variety of reasons, and we don't need to get into those. But I think even when it's uh, below zero, I'll carry water for my dog and and carry it next to my skin to make sure it's it's good because especially then they need it especially early season so i pack like what do i carry in my vest two kong water bottles i can show you what i use but it's a little one that the cup screws off you pour in the cup the dog drinks out of it you don't waste it you pour it back in you cover it up and you go i use two of those there and that's how i i balance myself other than that I have a little kit that weighs about eight ounces that I can take care of my dog. I don't, I carry a few, if any, tools. I carry a knife and I carry where I can get at them within five seconds, snips in case the dog gets in the snare and I've saved my dog's life with those before. I'll carry 50 pounds if you tell me I have to to save my dog, but I don't need to, I know what I need. I carry as little as possible. I, I'll start, it's, I'll, I'll put in an extra piece of clothing, a lot of what I'll carry if I need it especially in colder weather is a, a light little packable down vest. That's it. I don't need anything else. If it's cool, if it's in the morning, you start up cool, I'll start out with maybe a little more than I need and then I'll shed that layer, um, strap that to that back of my vest and I'll carry a little, people joke, I'm pretty much on a mission when I hunt and I sort of forget to eat and stuff like that. And uh, I hunt hungry in, a, for, in, in both literally and figuratively, but I do carry some, some food along with me, but I carry as little as possible. Um, my gun, I, I hunted many, many years with the pump and I uh, recovered from that among other things in my life. And I've switched to a semi-automatic. I shoot a little Benelli ultralight, 24 inch barrel. I shoot everything from turkeys to, I've shot it. I haven't shot a deer with it yet. I do love it with pumpkin ball slugs each year. I'm trying to shoot a Wisconsin deer with it, but I need it within about 30 yards. So I carry that Benelli. I shoot improved cylinder choke from the beginning of the season to the end. I'm pretty simple. I'm just telling you what I do. I shoot, some people will disagree. I shoot seven and a half high brass loads from beginning to end on pheasants. Uh, with lead, and I shoot six bismuth uh, loads when I need non-toxics. I'm trending more and more just to using bismuth. When they come out with some seven bismuth, I'll probably go to seven bismuth full time when I decide, yeah, I better just start shooting non-toxics all the time. Um, I keep it simple. I shoot the same gun for, as I said, you know, three ounce doves to three pound roosters to 120 pounds to 20, 30 pound gobblers to a deer if I can. I, I, I want to know that gun inside and out and I, and I do. Um, so that's what I do. You know, size six shot is a really good lead compromise. I, I, I think, I think the, some of those bigger shots, I'd rather have more pellets. They've all got the same power. I'd rather have more of them and knock those birds down. Um, especially if you got a good dog who's going to find them. Um, so 
that's how I keep gear. I'm pretty simple in, in this on it. <laughs> awesome. Um, let's get into, we'll get into some Q and A. And the one, one question here that I got, I received, we received a lot of is, um, you know, if you, if you don't have a dog, how does that change your scouting and how does that change your hunting? It doesn't change your scouting at all. In fact, it makes your scouting more important. I would say even more important. Um, you know, I, I, I do, I scout. I have eyes in various places in pheasant country that scout for me. And I, you can't put enough emphasis on it, but you can't always do it. With my dog, and I would say the year, some of the years I've hunted, I can, I can drive out and find a spot and think, yeah, I'm just gonna hunt this, screw it, I don't care. Um, but scouting is very important. If you don't have a dog. You, you, you want to know there are birds around. Um, how do you do that? Late summer, early, in early September, which is late summer, I guess. Get out and do your own roadside surveys. Look up some of these onyx spots that look good. Get out to those public lands. Drive those back roads. Look for those broods. Look for birds out on these dewy mornings and set yourself up for success. And this goes dog or not, but especially without a dog, find those areas where there are birds. So you know there are birds there from the start. Uh, know, know what pheasants want. Think about what we've talked about for habitat and a mosaic and crop edges. I think, you know, you love those crop edges a little more even than I do. Love, love those crop edges if you're a dogless hunter. That's one of the places where you can pin one against a harvested field and in the cover. You know, love the crop edges, love the cover, love those crop edges. How do you hunt? That's a big challenge when you don't have a dog. Can you get birds? Of course. How, how would I do it? How have I done it on the rare occasions I don't have a dog? And how would I do it if I didn't for a hunt? I would go as slow. I'm not gonna say as slow as possible, but slowly. The faster you walk, the more of those fences are just gonna let you walk on by. So one, walk slow. That, I even, let's, let's start even before that. One, hunt good cover on that blue stem. Get in cattails, don't worry about that. Get in the willows if it's a shitty day. Hunt late season. You get a little advantage, believe it or not, in late season, and we'll talk about that, so one. Good, good places to hunt through scouting and through knowing good cover. Two, walk slow. If you go fast, you're gonna, they're just gonna you walk past them. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. End of period, end of sentence, period. Three, never walk a straight line. Zig, I, I've, I've written this before. I can't probably come up with all the words, but zig, zag, wander, backtrack, angle, backtrack, look at something else. Go look at that piece of go look at that piece of cover over there. Go look at that. Never walk a straight line. If you ever saw, there used to be a cartoon where the kid would go from house to school and he'd go. That's what you got to do when you're hunting on your own. Um, I'll tell you a story. Last year, I I got this bird without my dog. My dog was around. We hunted what I call a little pickpocket property very slow I had the dog through it and the dog might have helped by pushing birds back i came out toward the toward the road is a 26 acre property i got out to the road i got into the ditch between the the fence and the road and or actually i was on just on this side of the fence and the, and the ditch was right in front of me and i thought if i was a pheasant what would i do and i thought i would run up that road up that fence i took three steps and out goes a rooster Dog wasn't pointing it, dog was 40 yards the other way. If I hadn't taken three steps that direction, that rooster would have, would have survived. As it, as it turns out, it took me three shots to catch up to it, and then I winged it, the dog ran it down. But that's, that's pheasant hunting, it gets a little ugly sometimes. But I took three steps, and I didn't have to, but I thought, screw it, I'm gonna take three steps that direction. That's one of the secrets to hunting without a dog is no straight lines, go from spot to spot, stop every once in a while, wait. 
you'll be surprised you take another step, out he goes, especially late season. You're in those cattails, they, they're tuckered in, they're tuckled in those cattails, I call it. And you stop, move a little, stop, backtrack. You know, I think late season is one of the best times to be a, a, a walking dog with sun. Yeah, those are all fantastic tips. One thing I'll add to that as well as I look for, um, I, I honestly do the same thing when I'm hunting with dogs, but I'm looking for hard edges. Yep. Like I am, I'm walking towards the edge of a cut crop field where yep. I'm forcing those birds up to make a decision to fly. Yep. Yeah, very, um, because, very good tip. Yeah, because if you're walking through the middle of a piece of cover, that's endless. Like that one we, we referenced in South Dakota, they could run 50 yeah. yards and then just do an end around, right? And you don't have yeah. a dog to track it. So um, I also look for little pieces of property, small pieces of cover that are, you know, yeah. even half an acre, an acre, yeah. um, brushy areas, um, something that you can walk through, especially if more than one person uh, that you can you can hunt it in concert together um, where those birds really don't have an option other than to get out and fly. Yep, and, and if I was hunting with a partner or two dogless, I would say one hunter is sort of the guide hunter and everybody else just sort of flanks them. You always sort of know where everybody is, but let, let, let one hunter sort of choose, choose the path. And your, your tip is absolutely right about Find something you can maybe pin up against a crop field. Late in the day is a good time to be a solo hunter without a dog. Um, and also think, think the, those, I call them pickpocket properties, those little ones, but also think micro on the macro scale. Even if you're in a 40 acre property, which is small, think about, you know, there's that catch of pantails is about the size of my bathtub. I'd go there. That's all, that's all you got when you're without a dog is your feet and spots to go. And, and you can get birds, but go slow, wander, stop, pause often. Don't, don't let them figure out what you're doing. I'll even backtrack and go back along the path if I think, man, I just sort of think there's a bird here. Does it maybe one time out of 15? Is it worth it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, exactly. Because a lot of the times it's those instincts, right, that are like, I don't know why I want to do this, but I feel like doing it. And a lot of the times that's going to pay off for you. Um, another question here, this is a great one, is advice for hunting cattails. And we could probably sit here and talk for two hours on on cattail hunting strategies. So, like, what uh, you know? A, let's start off with. What cattails are you, what complexes are you choosing versus what you're not choosing? And then when you get there, um, how are you hunting those? I'm thinking on late, I'm thinking late season when I think about cattails. Sure. I'll hunt cattails at other times of year, um, but to, to make the assumption of late season, I'm looking for not a sea of cattails. Nobody wants to get involved in that morass. Uh, and, and frankly, getting your ass lost out there. I mean, what I look for is a good, I call it a, a line of cattails, a, a swath of cattails that abuts good cover. It, the classic, and in, in, in I can guarantee it was on that property we looked at uh, earlier in, the, in our program. I can guarantee it's in places in North Dakota, Western Minnesota, South Dakota, you name it. It's frozen. There's frozen or maybe even open water out uh, on the slough. And there's a ring of cattails. Maybe it's 30 feet wide. Maybe it's 60 or 70 feet wide. And then there's habitat and or crops on the other side. I like to get in that contained swath of cattails. And I just circle the whole dang slough. I just get in, pick up, I'm starting here, and I'm going to walk the whole slough. And how do I go? slow. Um, I don't, I, I'd also, I'd also borrow somebody's 80 pound lab and have him crash it. I've got a, I've got a 30 pound French Brittany and she pretty much crawls under it. And she, she's, she's, she's hell and cattails on birds, but we just go slow and we wander and we, we do what I said for the dog with something. We go back and forth and I stop and I let her work and I have a belt. Some people, you know, people use a flushing dog. Don't and 
few few pointing hunters have a bell anymore. And some that bell goes silent. I'm like, oh my god, it's going to happen here. So people say, well, why do you use a bell? Why don't you use a beeper? And I'm like, well, beepers can alert pheasants, and there's nothing wrong with them. It's just not my style. And number two, they say, well, how do you find your dog? I said, well, they say I get I get two really exciting things. One, I get to look for my dog on point, and I find my dog on point and say, oh my god, there she is. And then I get to go in and find the bird, and hopefully he's still there. They will walk off, but I get two two exciting things happening with my little dog. Where we go slow, and we go back and forth, and pheasants will run in cattails, but you've also got a chance to get them to hunker in, and that's what you want. And that's when you're you keep that keep that flushing dog close. I keep my pointing dog close. I'm not a purist. I don't care. She doesn't point it and it goes out. I'm shooting it. That, that's that does stuff doesn't matter to me um, because that's pheasant hunting. And you just cat. And so I'd stay away from those cattail seas. Those are just unless you got a big group. Get a big. You want to get a big group and get them in there, pounding it, and get birds flying all over and. You see one land and stuff like that. That's that's a heck of a lot of fun. Um, but I, I think your question is the 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 lone or the small group hunter. I look for those bands, those swaths of cattails. And let me show you. I'm going to pull up my map here and just kind of show you what Carp is referencing here. So like, this is a prime example of something I probably wouldn't touch with a 200 foot pole. I mean, if you look at this, uh, we'll use the line distance tool. So from pretty much one edge, like uh, to here, I mean, that's a mile. This thing goes for probably another mile. Like, A, the odds of you, yeah, are there birds in there? Of course there's birds in there. But the odds of you finding them and then B, the odds of you pinning them down are almost zero. Like Carp said, they love to run. They'll run around. They'll, there's just nothing to push them against. Um, so a, a perfect instance that he was referencing is a spot like this right here, where you look at this piece of property and you've got, again, that little that little pocket of cattails here, you can tell um, darker cover. In the middle, there's some of that algae there. Um, and this, for example, is at the widest point is gonna be 80 yards. So that's very manageable for a person, a couple guys and their, do and their dog, especially because it narrows down through here. So you're funneling, I'd probably start at the big part on the southwest and then push it up through here, funnel those birds into those neck down areas to get them to fly. And, you know, there, there's I'd, this is pretty textbook. I'd circle them too, uh, you know, I mean circle them meaning I would walk around it and then I'd walk up the next one and then I'd do that oval, I'd walk, you know. Yeah. And you just co cover some ground. Um, so a lot of the times I'll use this this line distance tool when I'm finding areas like this because again like as a as a single hunter um like even a spot like this this is that's a 200 yards wide you know to be honest it's it's probably a good area but I'm going to probably try to find more spots like this um that that's just more manageable I think my odds of success are going to increase in areas like this versus those larger areas as a lone hunter or maybe with two people. Do you agree with that? To some extent, to the most extent, but as I look at that, it looks it looks almost like crap on the on the inside. Yeah, I mean, this is all crop here. I so might, I mean I, I hunt it. Yeah. I might I I if late season I'd probably 200 yards wide. I'd probably but if, if you're looking at it, that's what a 160 here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, that's 20 acres. I'd spend an hour in that 20 acres in that southeast yep, corner right. of that piece right there and go back and it, if it was a cold day and snow on the ground and get in that, that 200 yard wide swath of cattails, I wouldn't be too afraid of that. I would be afraid of that mile across hell hole. <laughs> the only way, I, there's one way I'd go into that. You wanna know what it is? What's that? Frozen sloughs, because there's a lot of sloughs in there. In a fresh skip of snow. And I go up there and look for a track. If that snow came overnight, or, you know, and I had, I knew the tracks I was looking at were within a few hours old. And then I'd go in there and I'd just take little, little, little thrusts in where I saw some tracks. 
that's one way I'd go into that big one. I'd walk all those edges and and um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't go wade into any hundred acre cattail patches unless they had about eight eight la eight labs named Tank that I had in there. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, we've got time for a few more questions here. Um, this is a great question we want to touch on. Um, you know, as a employee of Pheasants Forever, uh, you know, as a landowner, what can people do to improve pheasant populations, improve habitat on their properties? Well, the biggest thing is to, to make that commitment that I'm going to do it. Uh, and the second thing is to know that you're not just doing it for pheasants, you know, and there's a lot of things that you can do that'll benefit a whole variety of wildlife. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically here, pollinators, butterflies and bees, which is actually some of the best upland bird habitat there is. Uh, you know, the first step is to get in touch with a Pheasants Forever Farm Bill biologist. And we have Farm Bill biologists across pheasant country. Uh, you know, you can go online, pheasantsforever.org backslash find a biologist. Their, their services are free of charge to any landowner. Their job is to act as an intermediary between a landowner and federal, state, and other programs that help that landowner fund habitat, whether it's CRP, CREP, easement, uh, grants, whatever it happens to be, their job as it being embedded in NRCS offices, ag offices, is to know the programs available for landowner, come out and do a site visit and make recommendations and help that landowner, you know, figure out, A, what am I going to do? B, where am I going to do it? And C, how am I going to get some funding to help me do this? So I'm not putting the entire bill, but helping, helping get it paid for. And that, that's the number one tip there is. Pheasants Forever, the only other organization in our country that employs, in the United States, that employs more biologists is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Pheasants Forever is number two in the United States. So that's what bio, that's what the biologists are for. And that's yeah. it's free of charge. They they work with you. That's what Pheasants Forever pays them to do. hundred percent. Yeah. And and you know, obviously a lot of people here are interested in pheasant hunting because you're listening to a webinar about pheasant hunting. But I strongly encourage you if you're not to become a member of Pheasants Forever. Carp, what percentage of dollars raised in your area stay in your area as a pheasant you know going to uh, habitat locally raised chapter funds 100 percent. that's the pheasants forever model is that the model for some of these organs other organizations and they're all great i mean you think about ducks unlimited national wild turkey federation i always say nobody's done more for pheasants than ducks unlimited and nobody's done more for ducks than pheasants forever Hand in hand, the greatest conservation organizations in the world, Rocky Mountain Elk, Delta Waterfowl, they're all great. The difference with Pheasants Forever is local dollars raised by the local chapter never leave that local chapter. They don't funnel back to, to national and get, get a skim off and come back or get a, you have to get give your money away, get approved. Local chapters control those local dollars. So the answer is 100% locally raised dollars by Pheasants Forever chapters go back to local programs for habitat and heritage and, and other mission related programs. The answer for Pheasants Forever as a whole is about 88%. And we're a, you know, a top, uh, top, top navigator charity uh, in that respect. We're, we've inched below that 90% just a hair, um, but it's still hands and tails one, one, uh, among NGOs, one of the top ones. So you know your money's going to habitat and the birds. Yeah, exactly. So so get involved in your local chapters because all that money is ultimately going to A, habitat projects, B, land acquisition. Um, I believe, I don't know if it's in there yet. If not, it should be in the app very shortly, but we've got a new Pheasants Forever layer uh, in there that you'll be able to click on different properties um, that were either acquired by PFQF or uh, that were improved and you can read about some of the work that they're doing on the ground. So um, if, I could, if, I could, if I could interject there, if you hunt pheasants, and you hunt public land, 
in the main core pheasant range. You probably hunt birds on a, on a public property that pheasants forever was key to the acquisition of. Now, how many acres has pheasants forever made permanently public in its 40 year history? It'll surpass 220,000 acres this year. So we need you, if you hunt public lands or if you're a pheasant hunter, you care about upland wildlife and habitat, to be a member of Pheasants Forever and help do your part for that public land story. Let me tell you what, what 220,000 acres is. It's about 1,400 square miles, uh, or it's about 300 square miles. What's 300 square miles? We talked about walking. If you walk the perimeter of each of those, it's about 350 square miles. If you walk the perimeter of each of those square miles, you're gonna walk 1,400 miles. This is all lands made public thanks to Pheasants Forever. How far is that? That's from the Peace Garden entrance to Canada and North Dakota to south of Austin, Texas. And you've only walked the perimeter of each of those square miles. We need you to be a member of Pheasants Forever and help that aspect of our mission, which is there's many aspects to the mission. And one of them is public access. And one part of public access is public, permanent public lands. That's, that's that part of it. So I just wanted to get that point across as we talk about hunting public lands, about what pheasants forever. And oh, big, big surprise, Ducks Unlimited and others like that also do. Buy a duck stamp. If you buy a duck stamp, I guarantee you it's going to make a pheasant for you. Buy a mm -hmm if you don't hunt dogs, I'd buy two everywhere. Yeah, absolutely fantastic work. Um, we appreciate it. Super appreciate you a ton for coming on tonight. Um, if there's anyone interested in the, the OnX swag giveaway, uh, be sure to cl uh, click on the link in the, in the uh, chat that we're going to post if you want to sign up. Um, Carp, where can people, if they want to follow along with your hunts or you know, see what you're up to. Where can people follow you? Well, I'm not as I'm not as socially active as I should be. Um, I I think the best way is join Pheasants Forever and read our blogs and, and follow our social media. You'll see my blog posts coming up there, my updates. Uh, so follow Pheasants Forever social media, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook. And also get get the magazine. Uh, that's that's really where I spend a lot of my time and a lot of that content and content that doesn't make the magazine feeds into our digital platform, PheasantsForever.org. So follow our Pheasants Forever social media, um, and that that's the best way. Um, I've got a lot of good hunts planned this fall. And for Pheasants Forever, I'm hunting with a chapter in Iowa. We're hunting an acquisition that Pheasants Forever helped complete. Uh, and one of the first acquisitions in Iowa, I'm going to North Dakota, for Ni or Knife River chapter in North Dakota, or the Marshall Tama chapter in Iowa, um, uh, planning some other hunts. So all that goes, all that gets, gets on our social media and in our magazine and more. And um, we have some great membership offers too. Check online now. I think it's, uh, I think it's our hat and uh, net cozy. Uh, it's a pretty popular offer going on right now, you know, get involved in the habitat organization and be a part of it it's uh, we're, we're doing great things and we always need more members there's a lot of clout that goes on too with having all of our members and making uh things happen in 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 congress uh we we had a senator from iowa call one of our reps when we we're on a on a mission there and a rep said well we told our members and the senator said yeah, and I heard from every damn one of them. So we make things happen. We we put up we put up little uh, we put our foot in the ground and we make ourselves heard. So we need you. That's fantastic. Yeah, very well put. Um, if you guys want to learn more about um, scouting for pheasants, hunting for pheasants, um, uh, I think in a few days here we're going to be posting. There'll be a YouTube video on on Pheasants Forever's YouTube channel. Uh, it's myself and Will Clayton. We're going out and, and hunting public land in Minnesota. We cover a lot of these same topics and are going to show you what a lot of that habitat looks like on the ground. So if you're interested in learning more, be sure to check that out. 
Um, if you were late to the webinar, you didn't catch, catch everything, um, it'll be posted tomorrow on YouTube so you can watch it in its entirety. But again, uh, thank you to everyone who came and joined us tonight. And Mr. Carpenter, thank you as well. And we uh, hope you have a fantastic pheasant season. I know you'll make the most out of it. Thank you, well, I'll just leave us with this thought is, uh, and I'm not lying here, the last thing I usually do at night is time with my Onyx, and I dream of these places I've been, and I'm scouting places I'm going to go, and I even load up, I even load, I load up a picture with every bird I get. I mean, there's so many things you can do, as we talked about with Onyx, to make yourself a more successful hunter. But it's also just just a boatload of fun to have and to use. I call it onyxing. I don't know if you ever use that as a verb, but I use that as a verb. So there you go. Oh uh, well, I, I we surely appreciate it, and uh, hopefully everyone has a fantastic season in the field, and we look forward to uh, seeing your successes. So thanks everyone again, and have a good evening. Thanks everybody.